man, I've got certain information, all right? Certain things have come to light, and, you know, has it ever occurred to you that uh, instead of, uh, you know, running around uh, uh, blaming me, you know, given the nature of all this new shit, you know, it, it, this could be a, a, a lot more... Uh, 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 complex. I mean, it's not just, it might not be just such a simple, uh, you know? What in God's holy name are you blathering about? Well, I'll tell you what I'm blathering about. I've got information, man. New shit has come to light. And, and shit, man. She kidnapped herself. Well, sure, man. Look at it, you know, a young trophy wife in the parlance of our times, you know. She uh, uh, owes money all over town, including to known pornographers. <laughs> and that's cool. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Stuff We've Seen. This is Jim. And now, here he is, the new West Wing sensitivity trainer, Teal. You got your work cut out for you, pal. Oh, no kidding. <laughs> I, don't think, I don't think you're going to be able to do much there. Well, I, I, I held a, a, a seminar earlier today. Nobody showed up. <laughs> they were busy. Uh, do, do, you, you were in North Carolina when you were supposed to be in South Carolina. Yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll figure it out one of these days, though. Don't don't worry about it. I got this under control. Something tells me by the time we tape our next episode, you'll be on to bigger and better things. <laughs> <laughs> you seem to float around in these jobs. So I do. I, I Yeah. I, I can't really uh, seem to hold down a job very well these days. But uh, All right. Hey, everybody. Um this is the show, and we're getting ready to talk about movies. Yes, some some movies we've seen, and maybe a few, and maybe a few we haven't seen. Well, probably on your end, sure. Yeah. <laughs> um. So so so, kids, uh, our last program uh, was actually very popular. A lot of you have listened. Uh, you know, we 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 know that uh, Midsummer has been, or actually, it's like. Midsommar is what I've been told it's called, uh, but I prefer Midsommar better. Uh, <laughs> what do they say in the movie? I don't know. I You know what? That's the part. Just, I, I, I think they say Midsummer. They probably do. Yeah. Um, I know that the uh, the kid who vapes throughout the movie probably did because he was an obnoxious American. <laughs> Stereotypical. <laughs> and he was just going to say Midsommar. Um, so... That is kind of what's been on a lot of folks' mind, and there was a lot of Reddit threads about it. And uh, so, you know, we posted a link to that episode, and a lot of uh, Reddit people responded. And so uh, if you're new to the show because uh, you found us from some Reddit posts, hey, uh, welcome. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know, you may, you may be finding us on this show because we are going to be talking about a film that is heating up the Reddit threads is <laughs> under the Silver Lake. It's heating um, up the internet I, and, and has is. been for a while now, I think. Yes, this is a this is I would say a box office failure because it really wasn't released uh, so much as escaped into a couple of theaters. Oh, is that OK? I, I, yeah. I didn't I didn't look into this. So that's what happened. Just came out in a few theaters. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you the story in a okay. second. Um, but it is designed not for the masses, but for those kind of cinephiles out there who love uh, a good mystery or puzzle and like to analyze, dissect, and, you know, hunt down clues after the fact. Yes. And so, you the, know. This is a movie made for fan theories. 
It is. And of course, <laughs> uh, you know, I mean, you can't, well, I guess you can manufacture something like that because this is a good case of it. But uh, well, <laughs> yeah, I think you can manufacture. I mean, it's, it's, it's different than trying to manufacture a cult film, which uh, I'm thinking about with shock treatment. Have you seen shock treatment? Ooh. Yeah, you know, it's funny. Well, we mentioned shock treatment like in yeah. passing on a former episode, but I literally had this same thought as you did that that was a, an example of a film that was created for the sole purpose of trying to capture the magic that was created from Rocky Horror Picture Show's exactly. midnight uh, it was, screenings. They were trying to make another cult film and it didn't connect at all. Yeah. I mean, a great example, and it's funny because we'll be talking about this in the program throughout this hour, is The Big Lebowski. Yes. Right? Here's a film I saw opening weekend. I made you go see it, as you had reminded me. Yeah. And I saw it a second time in its initial run, and I loved it. I got the humor. I was, yeah. uh, like, cackling like Robert De Niro in Cape Fear <laughs> throughout the film, <laughs> and then people were looking at me like, what is this guy's problem? But, I mean, I just it, I felt I the just same way when I, when I first saw it. I just totally— But I literally—people yeah. people looked around at me like, I don't understand why he's laughing. <laughs> Um, but it, but it took, but so that was it, you know, it's like uh, just a film and then it took on a new life on DVD, which by the time it was released on DVD, it was, DVD was just really starting to hit the market. And I think it was one of those things kind of like Austin Powers that, Hey, there's this DVD thing out here, better quality than our VHS tape. And there's not that many titles available, but what is this thing? (laughs) And people (laughs) started to discover this movie and it's very quotable and they turned it into a cult phenomenon. You know, these night screenings and people starting to dress up and uh, 10 years after the film uh, came out, actually less than 10 years. uh, I'm sorry. It was probably, it was, 2005. So less than 10 years, I went to one of those first, it was a first annual Lebowski screening happening in Boston. Oh, wow. Yeah. And people were going crazy because I I think that the Boston theater, it was a Coolidge Corner theater, had heard that there were these screenings happening. Right. So now they've been doing it once a year. And, you know, that you cannot just the, the, the Coen brothers, I guarantee you, didn't create that movie so it could become a cult film. <laughs> no, not at all. It, it, <laughs> it's a very hard thing to do. And so I, when I say this is a movie created for that, I don't think that was their intention with Under the Silver Lake. Right. But I think what's happening and what you're going to find is that it is it has the potential to become the next cult classic. Yes. And I and I say that because I feel that maybe it's a year from now, maybe two years from now, if you're lucky enough to, say, be in one of these cities like Boston or L.A. or, or New York where you might get these late night screenings, they're going to be showing this. And what's and the, the audience that's going to come, it will fill that house because these are all the people that love this film. So yeah. now you're going to get to see it on the big screen with an audience that really thrives on it. Yeah. So is that happening? Is it playing? Um, Well, okay. So let's take you back. So what happened (laughs) is a couple of years ago, uh, the director, uh, David uh, Robert Mitchell. Who who had made uh, It Follows. He made It Follows and he made this other film uh, called uh, Myth of the American Sleepover. That's right. I have not seen that. Yeah. Now, so my history with him is... The Myth of the American Sleepover was another, I don't know if it ever got released in theaters, but it was a view on demand kind of thing. And right. uh, I was still, it was a couple of states ago <laughs> that my wife and I were living <laughs> in a place and uh, we stumbled upon this, you know, view on demand movie. Right. And I looked at the trailer and I, you know, I, I, I love coming of age films. So I said, well, this looks good. I showed her the trailer and she's like, oh, that's great too. So we did a very rare thing. We rented a, you know, view right. On just demand based film. on the trailer, just based on the trailer. And, you know, it had a certain aesthetic that I really liked and it had a few cool scenes. I don't think the film kind of fully came together, but I said, oh, you know, this director is one to watch. Yeah. And I, I liked the movie sort of now. Flash forward a few years, and right before I moved away from Massachusetts to the place that I live now, It Follows comes out, and I hear lots of great things about it, that it's just an interesting new horror film. It was playing in Boston, so before I moved, I went to see it, and I knew nothing about it. I didn't really know what the premise was. I didn't know who made it. I'm watching this film, and I'm loving it because it's giving me something a little different than most yeah. horror films were giving. And I love the music, which had a throwback feel. 
and and the really deliberate photography in the deliberate photography and so when you say that while i was watching it i i i made a connection and i said you know this whole feel and maybe because it was a michigan and yeah. part of me had remembered that the myth of the american teenage sleepover was also in michigan i said boy this film reminds me a lot of that film that i watched a few <laughs> years ago i wonder you know if there's the same filmmaker and then after the movie and i check it out sure enough it is and that to me was pretty amazing that a director has already got a style that i could yeah. recognize without knowing that it was the, the same filmmaker yeah and yeah, and then after it follows, sort of became a cult film. I mean, people really like that film. Yeah, it's become you know it, it's sort of like it, again it did fairly well for such a yeah. low low budget independent film uh, in theaters, and then you know it's built a follow, following and it's been added to the canon of horror films, and it's kind of yeah. a classic in its own right now. Um, so I've been waiting since then for the next uh, David Robert Mitchell film. And I knew he was making some film called Under the Silver Lake, and um, I knew it starred Andrew Garfield, and I was just waiting patiently. And then I heard it was going to be at Cannes last year, so 2018, and uh, I was excited because I, I was like, okay, then it'll be coming theaters. And around that time, I saw a trailer for it, and the trailer looked pretty cool. Mm-hmm. And I think that the the sort of PR on it was that it was sort of a kind of a wild kind of mystery adventure in L.A., right. kind of like a big Lebowski. And so the trailer looked kind of like wild and fun. And I, I was like, I can't wait to see this movie. And then it bombed at can. <laughs> right. Yeah. Like, I mean, people basically booed it at can, right? Yeah, or just even worse, I think, than a boo is that it gets no buzz whatsoever. It was right. sort of like overlong that, uh, well, this guy kind of shot his wad where you know he made this one successful movie. So now somebody gave him a bunch of money and he ran amok with it. And nobody right. was really interested in kind of diving into the film other than they just felt that it didn't really add up to anything. So... There was, a, there was a thought because the movie was about two hours and twenty minutes that maybe he would go back and retool it and you know, right right um, a a twenty four was had picked it up for release and it was originally going to be released later that summer kind of one of those late in the summer kind of right, fill yeah. in with it, alternate choice film it has that feel. And then it was going to be like fall, maybe the end of the year. I think maybe they thought, well, maybe we can sort of push it for end of the year critics or something. It, that didn't happen. <laughs> then it kind of just disappeared. Like nobody knew what was going to happen. And that was supposed to be maybe in like February, which actually might have been a good time for it. <laughs> yeah. You know, February of this year. And then again, nothing. And, you know, the impression even that I get is like, OK, well, you know, if a film is just shelved this long, that it's probably a reason. It's probably not very good. Yeah. <laughs> And then I hear that it was getting a one week release in L.A. and maybe New York. And then it was going to, you know, view on demand. A24 was basically dumping it. They didn't know what right. to do with it. And, you know, they're a small they're a small distribution company. They can't spend a lot of money on a film that they knew they probably aren't going to get back if they spent that. It, well, exactly. And it's a very difficult film to market, I think. Yes. Well, that's so that's the thing. So I was still when it was on view on demand, it was A24. So A24 has a deal with Amazon and right. I know that eventually it's going to be on Amazon Prime. And then I read that July 1st, it was going to be on Amazon Prime. So I could watch it um, for free essentially because I have Amazon mm-hmm. Prime. And I was excited to sit down and watch it. I, again, didn't know anything about the plot. I just really want to make that clear. I really didn't know. Um, but I had a preconceived notion Right. Of somehow in my own brain, the sort of pace and the style and the mood that the movie was going to be. And my wife and I sat down to watch this thing. And first, I was like, we, the, we weren't going to watch the whole thing the first night. We was just like, let's give it 20 minutes to see right. what we got. And I remember watching the opening scene and thought, hey, you know, this is pretty cool. You know, the director, he really has great command of the yeah. camera. And I just like the the setup and everything that's going on. But after 20 minutes, I was struggling as to what the point of the movie was. <laughs> and I didn't like the character at all. Um, and, but yet the, and somehow in that 20 minutes, there was just something, I, I think he just met uh, Riley Keough's character. Right, right. 
And I said, okay, there's just enough here to make me want to come back and watch it again. So like then two nights later, we get back to it. And this time we get to about 48 minutes. And I was like, I don't know if I really like this movie. <laughs> well, it's not like the music doesn't seem right. <laughs> it, it's sort of like weird, like they like got Hitchcock music, but where's the comedy coming in? Like I, I just was thinking I was going to be, be watching a dark comedy or something. Right. And there were things that were bothering me, like like his character. And again, it was just the way his character was being played. I he was a smoker and it and I didn't I didn't like that because they showed this pack of cigarettes and they showed like Morley and right. I was like you know <laughs> that's like a throwback to um to the X Files and then other movies do it as sort of a takeoff right so right that just that distracted I'm like this movie I'm starting to like I don't know if this director even knows what the hell he's doing but so my wife falls asleep <laughs> and just as she falls asleep something interesting happens. That makes me want to continue watching it. So I shut it off and I tell her, yeah, you know what? I was thinking I'm going to throw this movie to the garbage, but I'm interested again. So we're going to have to watch it. So what was the thing that happened that got you interested? Um, And it may not have been 48 minutes. It may have been a little bit later. But... I, cause I, cause I was watching it and I knew she had fallen asleep, but then I was starting to get sucked in a bit. Right. And I think it was that he started to make, oh, it was when he made the connections, uh, on the song and he started writing the code in the pizza box and then he goes out to Griffith park and right. he meets the homeless king. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And the that... homeless king takes him away. And that's when I shut it off and said, oh. You know what? I think I think we've got something going on here. Jin, my wife's going to have to watch it, so okay. we're going to have to rewind ten minutes. So here's uh, the point I want to make about this: is that in most movies, that scene with the homeless king would have is the twenty minute mark. <laughs> is is the twenty five? Yeah, it, it basically it's the end of the first act. It's the instigating event. Yeah, and so what? <laughs> well, the instigating again again would be I guess when he discovers the code. Yes, that would be the insca- yeah. no, but the but the act turn the end of the first act would be meeting the homeless gang, and so as a result of employing a slightly different narrative structure, you don't feel like it, it, it's not giving you what you expect from a movie in the no. uh, in the time frame you expect it, and so you feel a little unmoored, and you're not sure where it's going, and it feels unstructured. And and so I think that has something to do with what you're talking about, like 20 minutes in. And and at some point, I think I was about 45 minutes in or so, and I just thought, oh, this is a shaggy dog story. Yes. And, 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 and you know what? I'm okay with that. I can go with a shaggy dog story. Well, so yeah. So the, so the next night or two nights later, I'm like, we're finishing it. We're going to finish this thing. Uh, and we watched it. And that's where, you know, the second half of the movie definitely just in, you know, as a, as a regular narrative film, it picks up. It's interesting. Yes. Um, and so by the end of it, 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 I realized, oh, I was watching this movie the wrong way. Right. right. And I don't want to give anything away at this point. Now, this, this is going to be another episode with spoilers. So I think we haven't really spoiled much at this point. But if you. The, this is the point of no return. Yeah, this is the point, <laughs> the instigating event where we're going to start to spoil things or we could start spoiling things. So you get out now. Um, so. <laughs> so when I was left, my initial impression is as a straightforward narrative film, I think the film failed and I gave this film probably like a C. Yeah. However, however, <laughs> I started to formulate well, well, some. Wait, wait, wait no, I'm not. I'm not going to say anything. I just want to oh, tell okay. you that I won't because I, I, I want to talk to you right. and get your thoughts. Is that I was left intrigued, and I started, of course, to go online just to see what some people were thinking, and because I had some ideas of what right. I really thought the film was about. And once I started to open that doorway into the internet, I suddenly realized, and for reasons that you're going to understand very shortly. I felt I had to rewatch this entire movie. And yes. part of, and then I and when I went to sleep that night, I couldn't get the movie out of my head and I had to rewatch the film. And so I rewatched the movie in a way that I don't typically rewatch a film. I watched it almost in a passive way. I wasn't watch since I already just saw it and I know yeah. what the story was. I actually purposely watched it almost at this sort of a disinterested level where I was looking at almost anything other than what I should have been looking at. 
And by the end of the second time around, while I would still say as a regular narrative film, the film does not pass grade, I really, really, really like this movie, but for completely different reasons than I typically like a film. (laughs) And I can recommend it in a strange way for people who are looking for a certain experience. And now, of course, I told you you should see it so we could talk about it. And I turn it over to you to get your thoughts on the movie. Okay. Well, so I already told you my shaggy dog thought, which, which I still think, I still think it's a shaggy dog story, no matter how you approach it. And there's a lot of different analytical it's, Well, it's the journey is fun, right? If the, it, the, the journey, journey is, fun, is fun, and you're not, you're not going to get an ending that is going to tie it all together neatly. I mean, maybe, maybe you could argue that, but, but that's not what it's about. It's about following this kind of hapless guy on his uh, weird little adventure. Yeah, I mean, well, that's where a lot, there's been a lot of comparisons to The Big Lebowski yeah. and in the idea of a shaggy dog, except that in The Big Lebowski, um, the ending isn't as important as the journey, but there is the thing, the threads are wrapped up in a very yes. conclusive way. Yes, they are. And, it's, and I would say this movie doesn't really do that. That is correct. Uh, and so it, it is ultimately a shaggy dog story. So I realized that pretty, and so I, I knew nothing about this movie until you told me to watch it. Uh, and I would have, I, since I knew very little myself, but obviously when you, I buy that you knew nothing about this movie. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I knew nothing. You probably about wouldn't it. even, if I didn't tell you, you wouldn't have even known it was on Amazon probably. No, I wouldn't have. I wouldn't have known. Yeah. And so I watched it. Uh, yeah. I realized it was a shaggy dog thing. As soon as I realized that I was like, okay, I'm just going to go with it. Right. I'm just going to sort of let the movie unfold. Uh, I'm going to let go of my expectations about because at first I was like, I want some explanation for what's going on. The movie's not giving me enough. And I think that can be frustrating for probably 95 percent of the of movie going audience. A- absolutely, because the movie tells you that it's giving you stuff. It just doesn't explain it. And the movie, you know, we talked about this. Uh, I think we mentioned it when we mentioned this movie before, but they had like a cryptologist uh helping them encode the movie. The movie is filled with codes and riddles and clues. Uh, Well, there's two parts of that, right? So you have to have a cryptologist to make sense of what the narrative plot is, that this guy, um, he is either receiving or thinks he's receiving various codes. And so there has to be a logic to be able to solve those in order to further the plot. But then behind, there is another set of codes or puzzles for, for a keen audience to decipher. Exactly. And that yeah. is a part that is really sort of still up for grabs. And I don't think enough people on the Internet have solved all of that yet. Well, and I don't know. So when I was done with this film, I thought, OK, wow. OK, I can have a, a little more of my experience of watching it is that I actually really liked Garfield's performance uh, r- from the start, actually. Uh, I don't know that I liked the character. There's a scene where he like uh, beats up a kid. Um, <laughs> but that was that, that was some of the moments where I started actually liked his character because I said, "Wait a minute, is that, something's going on here that's a little different." No, I mean I I like him in the in the sense that I find him interesting. I wouldn't, you know, I'm I'm not saying he's a he's a nice person, but well, he kind of uh, reminded me a little bit of you, <laughs> except I, I for the beating up of the kid. Uh, yeah, I can see that. No, I I uh, I haven't beat up any kids recently, but. But it was kind of reminding me of those days when you were living in an apartment in L.A. That's yeah, reminded me of that uh, part of my struggling life on the fringes. <laughs> uh, but there, uh, I liked his performance. There was something about it that that drew me in. I found it uh, kind of funny, a, a little bit of comedy in it. Um, it's a subtle performance. It's laid back. And here's the thing: I hate Andrew Garfield. Wow, this yeah. is very strong language. Maybe yeah, you, it, maybe you you would beat up a kid. <laughs> I I might beat up Andrew Garfield. Now I I'm sure pretty Whoa. sure he can kick my ass. But uh, <laughs> put him in a grudge match uh, with Tom Holland. But my point is that I, I'm just not a big fan of Garfield. Um, yeah, I get you. Yeah, I didn't think he was a great Spider Man. I really didn't like that Mel Gibson movie. Um, Mel Gibson movie. Yeah, that war movie. Oh. 
shoot, I forgot he was in that. I'm not a big fan of that movie either. I, I think it. I think the battle sequences are great. Yeah, but, but yeah, I don't really like that movie. Gosh, I forgot he was even in that. Yeah, he's the lead in that, and, yeah, and we can't even got nominated for an Oscar, <laughs> and we can't even remember what it's called. <laughs> well, you know what? He's grown on me a little bit because when he first got on the scene. I thought his American accent was terrible. Yeah. And he's done it now for so many years that he's getting better and it, you forget it, it, that he's British. Uh, yeah, I think his accent is fine in this movie. Uh, and so my experience of watching this was kind of as a shaggy dog thing. I was looking for, I, I kept waiting for something that was kind of going to explain stuff for me. Uh, but then I realized that wasn't going to happen. And so when I got to the end of the movie, I thought, okay, the movie's not explaining it any of this for me I got to put it all together on my own and so I started thinking about it I didn't do what you did which was go to the internet I probably should have um well no I but I didn't go to the internet because I needed answers I right. went there because it was it, it took me through the whole film to understand oh I understand now, at least according to me, what Andrew Garfield's performance was about. And by the end of it, I was a fan because I'm like, oh, now I have to rewatch it because I realized I was watching his performance the wrong way. Yes. And when I rewatched his performance kind of in tune to what I was thinking, I thought this is brilliant because clearly he and the director worked this out ahead of time. Yes. Um, And it's just that the fan theories led me to solidify my own theory of the film, but also accept that there are many interpretations and yes. some people's are a little bit more far-fetched. And what I want to try to get through by the end of this episode, if we can, is I want to try to, to kind of go through and either accept or debunk some of the theories that are going okay. on because yeah. I have a problem. Like, even with my own theory, it's it's hard to fit in the logic. So I can't quite tell as if, all of us are missing one key thing that he wants us to know, or is he a little bit sloppy and that he doesn't quite cover all his bases in this, in the way he directs this movie? I, I would be inclined to believe that he does cover his bases just because the movie feels that confident, but I don't know. Uh, I, I think before we get in, I think all of these theories though, uh, have one thing in common, uh, which is okay. that, that they all rely, they all are somehow related to the idea of an unreliable narrator that i think is right i think when you watch the end by the time you get to the end of this film unless you're a person who cannot think on any level other than right. the first top level of your brain that you know and go well geez i don't get it then then you then you're out just right. walk away yeah. Yeah. But otherwise <laughs> you're going to realize that as much of the what the film gives you if you can accept as the actual plot you're going to realize that the guy he doesn't there's no voiceover right but but it's right, told but through it, his it's told through his point of view yeah yeah so that uh, you have to say this guy is a little bit unreliable <laughs> Well, and there's really specific things like uh, women barking like dogs where, you you know, you go, OK, well, that that that's not real. That's not really happening. Um, and the movie just comes right out and, and I think hands you that like this. This thing right. is not real. This is his perception of what's going on. Right. And, and I think the movie's pretty clear about that. It's less clear on some other ones. Well, it's weird is that a lot of times when those events happen. He ends up waking up yes. in his apartment. Yes. Um, and then there's some, you know, there's some little Easter eggs there. There's one time where some things happen and then he wakes up and his hand is stuck to a comic. Clearly he's ejaculated on his hand and it's stuck to a Spider-Man yes. comic. So there's a, like, there's a, like a little, some funny stuff there, but <laughs> the stuff that's happening it, right before that moment, right before when he beats up the kid and right. he catches that somebody has drawn on his car with ejaculate <laughs> yes a, a big penis and he touches it and so now you're even wondering how much is this like real or, or there's a lot of things that are very ambiguous going on yes and and it's very unclear whether it's his perception or whether it's real so i think the unreliability uh is a big part of this it, it made me think of detour so i kept thinking about that scene in detour where the guy falls out of the car and hits his head on the rock yes and you think, okay, that is probably what we're seeing. It, it It's not just the narration and detour, but what we're seeing might not be the actual way it happened. He wants to believe that the guy just hit his head on a rock when, in fact, he smashed him on the head with a rock and killed him. 
Yeah, I mean, and, there's that scene where the squirrel jumps out of the tree, lands on the ground, and then looks up at him. <laughs> yes. <It's> very strange. <laughs> it's very strange. It's so surreal, and it can't be really happening. It has to be from this character's point of view. And there's just a lot in the movie that comes out and explicitly says this is from his point of view. Uh, but still, while we're watching it, we tend it, it's a little hard to sort through what's real and what isn't. Because clearly some of it is real. So tell me, when you when you finished watching this film, yeah. what, and again, I know we're being a little bit mysterious for those who have not seen this movie and are going, I don't know what they're talking about. Like <laughs> I said, leave now, because you're not going to. We're talking to the people out there that have seen the movie, um, and you already know what happens. So yeah. when you finished this film, what yeah. was your impression of what you thought happened in this movie? Uh, I thought you had to, you have to formulate. I mean, I think some people can go online and then kind of be like, oh, I have a different thought now, but I had a very specific thought right. and I want to hear what your thoughts are. Okay. So early on in the film, uh, there's one thing that's going on in the film is there's a dog killer on the loose. Right. And that's in the very first frame where somebody yes. has putting this uh, soap, kind of the soap writing on the wall of a, of a coffee shop window exactly. saying, beware the dog killer. Beware the dog killer. And so I would say pretty early, not, uh, not super early on, but in the first half hour, 40 minutes, I thought, okay, he's probably the dog killer. And I, I again, I think this is my fault for watching it in too many installments. I... Yeah wasn't really focused on the aspect of the dog killer um, much until very, a lot later in the okay. story. Well, it just seemed like it, the way, because the, because the film opens with it, I thought this is kind of an important thing. Maybe part of the mystery is who is the dog killer. And so I was, it, that was one of the things I was looking for answers to in terms of like, what is the mystery what is trying to be solved here? And the dog killer is one of the things. And so I, I had this suspicion that maybe he was the dog killer. But then well, I, I start... also never believed there was a dog killer. For oh, that's maybe why okay. I didn't spend a lot of time thinking about it. Is that a? I think it does a great. <laughs> I think it does a great job of kind of putting that away for a while. Um, but I didn't buy that. Uh, like pretty, there was there was a point that I felt that this guy. Again, I was waiting for you to tell me your answer. You were not doing it. So I'll tell you mine is that I thought from pretty much the middle that this guy was crazy. Oh, oh, yeah. Well, I mean, that that goes along with that goes along with the unreliable part, though. Right. I mean, yeah, he, he's from a for a good portion of the film. I started to formulate the idea that this guy, he's not a dog killer, that he's a serial killer. <laughs> Oh, well, I think you're right uh, looking back. But no, my initial thought during the movie was that he was the dog killer. But in retrospect, yeah, I think he's a serial killer. I think, you know, one really interesting thing in this movie is that he doesn't have a job and doesn't do anything, but is about to get evicted and he has a nice car. So we know that he had income until fairly recently. And so something happened to him that has caused him to lose his job. He's had some kind of break. Yes, and we do, and well, this gets to the whole idea of what in this film do we feel that we can hang our hat on is an actual event that occurs. Even yes. if it's slightly skewed, what in the narrative really happens? Like, is there, an, is there a moment in the movie that we, are, that we can feel is reliable enough to say, yeah, this actually happened, this event? Uh, I think there's a few. Um, so... Like when he goes to the party and he sees what looks like it's his ex-girlfriend. Right. I think that's an important piece of the plot that explains maybe the break that he's had. Yes. I think that. Yes, absolutely. I feel that that moment happens. Well, and I think a lot of the moments happen, but through a, a sort of a twisted view of what happens. Right. Like a, Again, that scene in Detour. Yes, the guy dies. But what is what is the version of it that we're seeing? Well, like, okay, for instance, here's what I'm saying is when I think that it's hard to to know whether or not what's happening is happening. The question is, there's a lot of different characters that he interacts with. Mm -hmm. And the real question is, how reliable are those characters as real people? Right. 
So, the, for instance, he has this friend that comes over. She is a wannabe actress, and she's going on auditions. And one, one time she comes over to bring sushi, and yeah. she's dressed like a barmaid or something, a little bit kind of in that weird sort of cosplay male fantasy. Exactly. Um, and, you know, she's the one that's always kind of telling him that he smells. Well, because he gets sprayed by a skunk. Well, he girl. does, and that second time, <laughs> right. And she's also the one where the next time she comes over, she's wearing this fantasy, weird, like, sexy nurse costume. Yes. And I know it's supposed to be for an audition. And, and one, I guess one way you could look at it is that she's a real character, right? There's, yeah. I guess, nothing in the film that says she's not. Um, and it's not one of these things where she interacts with other people or doesn't, and it's like uh, that uh, Russell Crowe, Ron Howard movie. Right, right, back beautiful and say, mind. Oh, he yeah. wasn't talking to anybody. I mean, right. that's not the case. Um, but I don't think she's a real character. I think she's a figment of his imagination. Oh, really? And that when Wait, she... Wait, you're talking about the in, Riley Keel character? No, no, no. I'm talking about his friend, the nurse. The oh, the nurse. Up, the, the actress. Yes, she I agree reads, with you on that. Yes. She tells him when he's in the tomato bath, she's the one who's reading the Under the Silver Lake comic and tells the story of yes. the owl's kiss. And one of the things is that when he gets these pieces of information, including the Under the Silver Lake, uh, which is a conspiracy comic, right? is all right. of the conspiracies <laughs> in there start to, like, infiltrate this guy's mind, and they they kind of fill in the narrative for him. So yes. I, like, and this owl's kiss, this mythical creature that kills, I think that this now becomes the persona that, uh, the split personality that he has, uh, the psycho killer in him. Right. He formulates that as, ah, that's the killer is this owl's kiss. And, you know, remember, he's got this huge honking poster of psycho yes. in his apartment <laughs> and the whole idea is there's a guy who's got mother issues and he's got a split personality and the idea is that yeah. norman Bates doesn't understand he doesn't realize that he's taken on the personality of his mother and so i feel that andrew garfield's character it's his quest is twofold he's trying to you know unravel this mystery of what happened to this girl that was he you know met for one night in this right. apartment complex and she disappears but what really is happening is he's trying to unravel a mystery of the other personality who's going around killing people <laughs> yes it, it, exactly yeah he's basically investigating himself in a way yeah and, and that's really fascinating <laughs> yeah and so for me uh what really clinches this theory is uh, is the end with the bunker scene. So he, with the homeless king, finds this sort of, what I, I don't know, they're a cult of billionaires or something. Uh, the concept is they have themselves buried underground and covered in, uh, in, a, in a bunker covered in cement, and then they just uh, die there, basically. They're, they're, uh, they run out of food and they die. Uh, but they have this sort of hedonistic six months before they die. And to me, that was just really clear that that's where he had buried her. And that there's a scene when this happens, there's a scene where he talks to her on Skype, right? She's in the bunker and he's talking to her. To me, that was all about uh, him talking to the memory of her. And basically, he had buried her. And part of his mind is in denial about that. And so is keeping her alive. In and his mind that is exactly what I uh, think as well. Especially, it's just some of the audio, like the idea of this, like sort of con like buried in concrete, and you yeah, know, he. There's a scene, and everybody loves this scene. It seems to be the like sort of the unanimous consent that it, that the best scene of the movie is when he confronts the songwriter. Yes, and that's a weird scene too, right? It, it's a weird scene, and I think uh, again, I think the songwriter is a real character. I agree. Whether he looked like that and what he's spewing, it's clearly what this sort of, I, I call him schizophrenic character. Yeah. It's what he thinks. It's all of these conspiracies that he's built up. And Have when all he hears come this, down. Yes. Right. And they think he broke into this guy's place <laughs> and yes. he confronts. And even the confrontation with a physical confrontation, there's really no guarantee of it, it. From his perspective, the guy fires first, right? Yes, exactly. And then, of course, again, spoiler alert for those who are still listening. I told you to stop it. He does some uh, skull crushing. He does some skull crushing. Yep. Uh, <laughs> there's a cult aspect in Midsummer and ties in with this movie. And then there's the skull crushing diet. 
Yeah, the skulk. So he does, and it's and it's clear that like he's broken into this guy's house and threatened yes. him. Right, and, and then well, but also he gets this guy's gun. Right. Yes. He has that gun on him, and then he goes to the party, and he he runs into the heiress, right, of the right. billionaire guy that's gone, and then they go off, and then they go for this swim in the reservoir. And then magically someone starts, you know, shooting and she gets right. shot and killed. But he's the one who had a gun. So it seems <laughs> exactly. to me very well that in his mind there's this weird – he sees the fantasy element and then, of course, it gets broken up with a death that exactly. he's probably caused. But that he's in denial about. He's, like, exactly. refusing to accept this other part of himself. And then the question is, at the very end, at the very, very end, has he accepted this part? Yeah, I mean, it's a weird, that's a weird scene too. I mean, there's this whole thing and there's a lot of uh, chatter on the internet about this parrot. Some people thought he was saying, murderer, murderer, as if that, uh, you know, maybe this parrot knows and he has to get over there. Um, And then there's, of course, this movie he's watching at the end and it says, don't look down, look up. And then, you know, he looks up instead of down at the courtyard and, of course, he sees this um, older woman who's been kind of like hangs out naked across yeah. the way with this parrot. And next thing you know, he, he goes over to her and then they seem to have sex. And I look at that as, I don't, I'm not sure how realistic any of this is, but I feel like he's now having sex with his mother in a, in a sense. Yeah. And I've, the I've parrot like doesn't that... necessarily say anything. It's just kind the, of, squawking. I don't think the parrot actually says anything uh, intelligible through the movie, but I think the end, the mother symbolism to me is psycho. Yes. It's Absolutely. like that is the psycho reference right there. Yeah. And of course, you know, I mean, like, this has been talked about a lot and it's absolutely, I mean, you know, for, 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 there's a moment where he's in a, a sort of a celebrity graveyard and he's in front of Hitchcock, for, yes. <laughs> you know, for goodness sakes. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, I mean, again, th- that those references are so obvious that it clearly it's not supposed to be obvious for obvious sake is that this guy in his weird way of trying to solve a mystery, he is obsessed with old movies. He's trying to almost play out some kind of weird Hitchcock film. It's a, it's about a guy looking through references and clues and trying to find meaning in all of this. And that's exactly what the audience is doing at the same time. Absolutely. I mean, there's even, that's what, so then that's where this, this great music score by this guy, disaster piece who also did it follows. Right. And it, is it has enough of its own originality, but also beautifully harkens back to like Bernard Herman scores. Right. And, uh, you know, again, there's the the rear window aspect of him, mm-hmm. uh, you know, his, spying his all the people in the courtyard. Yeah. And there's even, uh, there's a sequence when he uh, first starts following uh, these other women and uh, it's right out of vertigo. Yes. Oh, absolutely. But that car scene. The car scene is yeah. right out of uh, right out of vertigo. Uh, yeah. And, and then and there's the, another movie that's uh, you've talked about this movie to me. Yeah. And uh, I had seen it on Criterion a few months ago. And if I hadn't seen it, I don't think I would have made these connections. But Nicholas Ray's In a Lonely Place. Oh, it, it absolutely. This is very similar to In a Lonely Place. So Humphrey Bogart invites this ingenue over to his apartment Mm -hmm. and he runs into Gloria Graham who has just moved into the complex and she lives in an apartment almost across the way, very much like an under the silver lake where Andrew Garfield is across from this uh, older woman. And this ingenue has been uh, brought in to work on a screenplay that uh, Humphrey Bogart's character is having a hard time writing. And there's a sort of scene of violence that they are uh, rehearsing out loud. And if you just heard the conversation, you might misconstrue it for violence against a right. woman. Right, right. And Gloria Graham does uh, overhear it. And we don't know exactly what she sees or doesn't see through her apartment. Right. Um, but then shortly thereafter, uh, the Humphrey Bogart's character is rousted out of bed by the cops, and some, mm-hmm. of course, the cops are some of it is, are his friends, and they uh, he's under suspicion for the murder of the ingenue because lo and behold, he sent her away, but now she's dead. Right, <laughs> and they even call in Gloria Graham, yes, bec- uh, to testify, and she doesn't exactly tell the truth because she doesn't mention the conversation that she clearly overheard. Right. 
she's attracted to his character. And so the, the rest of the movie, as he gets involved with Gloria Graham's character, he, Humphrey Bogart is under suspicion for this murder. Yes. And he doesn't give the uh, detectives or the audience any reason to not suspect him. <laughs> right, he, he's, right, right. He's rather suspicious. And, uh, you know, he's also not, he's a little bit violent and violent towards women. Yes, he, he has a little bit of an anger issue. Yeah. Um, so I'm not going to give away the rest of that plot, but it just the, the, the key tie in other than there's some thematics involved. And also there's this underlying theme that both films under the Silver Lake and in a lonely place conquer, which is the idea that Hollywood is this evil place. Well, that's something I was going to say is there's actually a subgenre here. Oh, yes. Mention that. <laughs> well, I want to hear. I mean, we're, we're, we're in noir territory. But we're in subgenre. noir territory, but there's a specific subgenre of Los Angeles noir. Ah, uh, yes, which kind of well, it's going to get into its own thing. There's, there's, there is, there's Los Angeles noir in the black and white period. Yes. Then there's the neo-noir of Los Angeles. Exactly. In the neo-noir, yeah, the Chinatown Los Angeles. But there's yes, still... but then there's another one. Which I think under the Silver Lake falls in, which is uh, it's very little known subgenre called the neon noir. Yes, the neon noir. Um, but <laughs> to in add to more confusion. <laughs> but in terms of the Los Angeles, yes, I, I think it, it it definitely it has things in common with all those genres. But in terms of the Los Angeles thing, there's something that's specific to L.A. noir. Which and yes, there's a video game called the L.A. Noir. I'm aware of that. It's based on all these movies. Um, oh, I'm not, but that's fascinating. Oh, yeah, it's fascinating. It's called L.A. Noir, and it's basically just an homage to all of these movies. Hmm. And of course, you know, the, well, and I think when you're saying the L.A. Noir, there's not just a crime angle or the protagonist that is a little bit suspicious, but right. it also involves the Hollywood industry. Yes, which often deals with issues of perception. And how we see things. And uh, like we were just talking about with uh, with the Bogart movie. Uh, but there's also sort of a surreal aspect. And if you read the original Philip Marlowe books by Raymond Chandler, there is some very surreal, strange stuff going on in those books. Uh, he's stumbling around kind of. It, it, it's very similar structurally. And in terms of its surreal uh, attitude. Uh, it's similar to the Silver Lake movie, uh, and and that's something you don't, you don't see it in the New York noir films as much. Uh, this surrealism and this idea of perception and reality, and that really comes in, uh, you know, Double Indemnity, uh, In a Lonely Place. Of course, we're talking about um, uh, The Big Sleep. Yeah, there's another one, uh, and I think it's L.A. as well. It's called Nightfall. Uh, yes. The Criterion had recently. Um, but the the reason why In the Lonely Lives, other than the similarities, why I bring it up is because it was directed by Nicholas Ray, who also directed Rebel Without a Cause, which yes. then <laughs> plays an, a key role in this whole puzzle movie uh, yeah. that leads his character to go to Griffith Park, which is the which is famous. Um, a lot of films use it from, you know, La La Land was most recently it featured yeah. prominently, but Rebel Without a Cause is a key component. And so I don't think it's by accident that there's some similarities within a lonely place because this film is about a, about a puzzle and a mystery on top of a puzzle and a mystery. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. And there's there's a scene in Silver Lake where he sees this woman walking down the street in a miniskirt. And then there's another woman and then there's another woman. And it's very surreal and almost uh, feels like a hallucination. Yeah, it's a very dreamy way. And this is actually yeah. where those are some of the trademarks that uh, David Robert Mitchell does. Absolutely. That is sort of like, I like, oh, that, that's a classic David Robert Mitchell shot. Yeah. And it does suck you in. When those moments happen, I start to groove on this film and say, oh, this guy is in command. You know? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And so then he finds out the women are all for an audition. Uh, but it's one of those perception things, and it's and it's one of the things that's surreal about Los Angeles is that you can see just people hanging out in alien costumes, you know, uh, and you will see a whole bunch of people all dressed alike uh, congregating on a street corner because they're there for an audition. And so there is something sort of surreal. And, of course, California uh, is known for its weird cults and religious beliefs and strange things like that. And that comes into play in this film, too. So there's something very California about this movie is the point I'm making. 
Yeah, I mean, you know, there's like so many metaphors going on and this whole idea of cults, right? Which is yes. why originally I thought it'd be a fun pairing with Midsummer because I was like, <laughs> hey, there's a cult tie-in. It's, there is sort of the real cult and then there's the metaphorical cult. Yes. There is a cult tie-in to the film Inherent Vice, uh, which is another film that mm-hmm. this movie has been compared to. That's another film that I would classify as a neon noir where uh, – the, the idea of the lighting plays a key yes. role and as far as the artificial lights and, you know, this kind of um, look at Southern California. Yes. A- again, it, again, it's an L.A. noir. But here's this thing about the uh, auditions, and I'm going to kind of spin this a little bit yes. because I want to tie I know where you're, I know where you're going with this. And well, I, okay, but you know, so so the auditions, they're supposed to be auditioning for like a film, and then yes. these characters, he's run into them before, which is also, of course, very suspicious. And there's a couple of takes. One is that these girls are actually, they're auditioning to be part of this cult. Right. That is a that possibility. Could be, that that's one possibility. Yeah. The other interpretation, going with my theory that he's a serial killer, is that he's choosing who he's going to kill. Yes, he's auditioning. Yes. And these girls are interacting with him in ways, but he has, and again, maybe they're, they're on the fringes. They're people that are looking for a break. Right. And if they are, in fact, you know, actresses. <laughs> and the, um, and, and also one of them says, this is the, my favorite line of the entire movie, <laughs> is he asks the balloon girl, as she's known. Right. And he's run into her several times. And I was kind of always suspicious of whether she exists or not. He asks her, he says, uh, are you an actress? And she says, oh, well, yeah, I um, I was in a commercial when I was six months old. <laughs> yes. that. Oh, that's such a great <laughs> line. Yeah. And it's just and it's just so deadpan. And it's yeah. but it's taken as if she's like, well, yeah, I have acting experience because I was a, <laughs> the I was a child was actress when she was six months old. It's like this is the kind of weird stuff that it gets and that I don't feel that it, maybe it has enough of. But uh, so this whole idea of this cult thing. I have one problem with my own theory of, mm-hmm. of oh, what's there's a real hole or not in your real. theory. Okay. Well, here it is. This uh, the the idea of this Riley Keough character who goes missing in the middle of the night, and she has some roommates. And yeah, and there's a weird symbol on her wall. Right, and they show up later. Right, they show up it, when he the has this conversation yeah. with her. They're down in this like magic pit, and of course, my theory says that he killed them all. Mm-hmm. And okay, but. And this is the part where I'm not sure, and maybe you can help me out with, is that either the direction, there's some missing gaps here, or, you know, there's something I just, I, 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 you can help explain for me. Right. There is the building manager who hates him and wants yes. to kick him out of his apartment for not paying his bills. Yes. Well, he, the first time we meet the building manager, other than the note that he's put on his door that says you're, you know, you're going to be getting evicted. Right, right, right. He says, he's, he's questioning where, what happened to this girl. And yeah. he says, you know, he's like, she moved out in the middle of the night. Who does that? And he says, well, people do it all the time. Big deal. Well, so what's going on there? Because if this guy knows she moved out in the middle of the night, right. how could he have murdered? You know what I mean? Like, how did that transaction take place? That's the one piece that's bothering me. Oh, that's interesting. Well, I guess, um, man, you could sort of speculate around that all day. Either the guy's not real. Right. Or, right, well, that's another that's another question, right? Is 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 the question is that he's homeless the entire time, and, right, and that's the, why he doesn't like homeless people. He's actually homeless, and that's why he smells. And exactly. in the end, he's looking out in an apartment that he imagined he lived in. Yes, that's so. I mean, in that case, that kind of solves that, right? That kind of solves it. Yeah, and of course, you know, sure, maybe he could have killed her and taken all her stuff and buried it out in the desert or something. Right. And that maybe this uh, guy didn't actually have a, he just, while well, she moved out, you know what I mean? And like, right. he doesn't care because he doesn't have to get the security deposit back. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, so I'm willing to say, I just, that was one that I was just really wanted to talk through because it was the yeah. one piece that wasn't fitting in. Um, well, and I think that, you know, the, the film does have as like a jigsaw puzzle. There's a lot of pieces that you can't quite figure out exactly how they fit. Um, and it's because there's multiple interpretations, which again gets back to this idea of perspective and point of view and how that is integral to the movies. This idea of how we see things and whether what we see is real or not. Well, on that point, so maybe you can help me out with this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. He has two male friend characters in yes. the movie. And, um, a cereal box guy. 
no, Serial Box guy is the guy who, who wrote the comic, right? Oh, that's right. Yes. Okay. Right. Now that character, again, you know, we're, we're all over the place, but in that case, uh, this guy is totally wacky and he's filled with conspiracy theories, which I think fills Andrew Garfield's character's head. Yes. And this guy has a secret room where he videotapes everything because he's so paranoid. Yes. <laughs> Later in the film, Andrew Garfield's walking by this guy's house. There's police tape and he finds out that this guy's committed suicide. Very right. suspicious. And so he then sneaks into the guy's apartment and he goes to the secret room, looks on the videotape, and on the videotape, he sees footage of the actual owl's kiss, yes. which is this mythological figure that the exactly. guy who wrote the comic was all afraid of. And the the reaction on Andrew Garfield is shocked. Yes. And my take is because I believe that he has turned his own killer character into this owl's kiss. Yes, he's so seeing he's seen himself. himself. Absolutely. And that's what shocks him. It's the first moment that he suddenly is grappling with the fact that he is, in fact, the killer. Yes. Um, so that car, no, the two male characters are his friend um, that's played by, well, what's his name? I the guy know. that's, uh, no, 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 you know him. He's uh, he's the guy that was in the, that 70s show. Oh, yeah. I just can't remember his name. <sighs> Damn it. He was also in um, Black Klansman. This is so sad. <laughs> We'll do some magical editing. Um, I'll insert his voice. So, when I, uh, so that character, I don't. I'm not sure is real. Right. The only interactions are just him and that character. But then there's this other character that he keeps running into parties. Yes. And. So that character, he has this scene where they go to a party, and this is hilarious, and I think it's a take on L.A. parties and try to schmooze, is it's a party where everybody has to just play chess. Right. <laughs> Which I think is very funny, um, and Again, I buy it's that. One, it's, it's a very L.A. kind of thing. Yeah, but here's why I think that character is real, and it's, it's very subtle. There's a moment where he's having a conversation with him, and they're sitting down at his outdoor party and he's mm -hmm. making a chess move. But then Andrew Garfield gets up and he walks away because he, some other piece of the puzzle has now un, you know, caught right. his attention. But we stay on the friend character and the friend character actually talks and says something like, oh, that's a bad move because basically right. Andrew Garfield's a terrible chess player. Right. But, <laughs> but my whole rule is if you're making a film and there's like fantasy characters, you would never have them... Um, have a shot all to themselves where they actually commented or that we could see that. Right. That's like telling the audience. Yeah, because it's outside. It's the audience's perception, not the character's perception. Right. So, again, I don't know, you know, I mean, I could be completely wrong on what David Robert Mitchell's vision is, but that's where I'm like, okay, that character has to be real because we've seen him right. uh, with no Andrew Garfield in frame and he actually talked. Are there any other characters in the movie that that happens with? I, that, that, remember I told you I saw it twice. Yeah. I specifically watched passively so I could pay attention to those scenes. And that's why I picked that up is because okay. I was trying to figure out which character do I think is real. And right. now we get into the homeless uh, king. Yes, the homeless um, king. I, I I find that character very interesting, and he's he's an interesting character. He's kind of funny in a way. There's some there's some yeah. humor to it. Um, now, what do you think? You tell me your assessment of this character, because clearly, if we're going on the theory about all the other stuff we've talked about, then he is not exactly the homeless king. No, he's not the homeless king at all. Well, uh, see, I heard a theory maybe from you, and once that got stuck in my head, it's hard to get rid of. That was what happened to me. And again, I don't know how it jives with all this, but you you go ahead and tell tell well, the, the theory the, that I heard. The, the theory is that the homeless king is a cop who's investigating him and keeps kind of stopping by. And at the end, he's basically taking him and saying, lead me to where you buried the bodies. Yeah. And he doesn't get any answers and he has to let him go. Exactly. Yeah. And yeah, so he sort of there's there's no consequence at the end, but that throughout the homeless king is and and it's funny the homeless king does sort of come across as like the shambling L.A. cop in a weird way. Yes, 
Yes. And then, you know, there's theories that the first time he takes them through the tunnels, right? Right. And that uh, someone says that that's the impression that Andrew Garfield's character has, that there's these tunnels and that there's this room and that he ends up behind a convenience store refrigerator. Right. But that perhaps he's actually um, homeless and a vagrant and he was sleeping at night and he got picked up and taken into prison just or jail for the night. And then he gets released. Um, And then the second time we meet the homeless king, this is where he's actually tied up and interrogated by the homeless right. king, which leads to believe that maybe Andrew Garfield's character is under suspicion for being. Well, and he's been know. taken in for questioning. Yeah, I mean, then he is in a sense, right? And so, one yes. sense, he really is being questioned by the homeless king, who thinks he's the dog killer. Um, and then, you know, I've heard other variants on this, by the way, that people who believe that Andrew Garfield was the dog killer, they think that the homeless king, like they're going on that literal thing that most right. of this stuff is taking place, that, that the homeless king uh, believes that he really is the the, the, dog, the killer. dog killer and that he only lets him go because he's satisfied. Or no, that the homeless king is the dog killer. And what? that he is, set, yeah, 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 that, that the homeless king is interrogating him and that he knows that Andrew Garfield knows he's the dog killer and he lets him go because he knows that Andrew Garfield's not going to say anything or something to that degree. Okay, well, that's, uh, look. There's hey. weird stuff going on. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm not going to diss somebody else's th- fan theory because I think, like, they're all kind of valid. That's the thing about this movie is that it's almost like a Rorschach test. Well, people have got the Zodiac codes going on. And oh, they're yeah. Definitely, like, they're finding all the numbers and their stuff. There's stuff in the very first uh, coffee uh, house. Yes. In the back, there's some codes that are underneath uh, the words that people are freeze-framing it <laughs> and looking at. Now, do you know, do you remember these things? Uh, I think they're probably still around. Alternate reality games, ARGs. You know me. This is not my area of expertise. Okay, so <laughs> the, not. I, I think one of the first big ones of this was for the movie AI, and okay. in, and in the trailer there were certain letters that were highlighted, and if you picked them out, it would bring you to a website that gotcha that had clues on it, and you could decipher these clues, and it would take you to another website. And it was you know sort of a marketing thing, but it was uh, basically following clues and and uh, figuring out codes. And I feel like this movie has a little bit of that going on. Uh, oh, yeah. I mean, this is my take on all of these. I believe that he's embedded because I know he hired somebody. There's stuff embedded in there. I think it's more for fun and to drive you batty. Um, but I'm also open to the fact that there might be a roadmap within the movie to decipher what the story is supposed to be. Right. OK, so you think that if you put the time in and... Uh, maybe collaborated with some other people and figured it out. Maybe. That... <laughs> well, I think it could be fun if, if you get some friends and maybe this is for a different generation, but <laughs> some friends, you know, they, they, they get a little under the influence and they sit around and watch this thing. They might be able to really have a good time. I think you really could have a good time because it's, it's, it's not a mind bending mind trip in the way that um, movies usually are when people describe them as that. Yeah, like uh, 2001, the ending right, or something. Right, or or just movies that have a twist ending. Uh, that was the other thing I was thinking about with this movie is other movies with unreliable narrators. I'm thinking about Shutter Island. Shutter Island, but yet that, you know, that's, that's I, I'm not a big fan of that movie. Oh, I, mean, I, 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 I really don't like the film at all, and here's why I don't like it. It may is, be the same reason as me, so tell me. Well, my, I, I have several reasons, but my biggest one <laughs> is that it has a psychiatrist come in at the end and explain the whole thing. That that is yeah that this that's that movie kind of feels dumbed down in that way. In that a I I picked up on it pretty early. Yes. And then at the end, it was sort of like trying to like make those people that love those big shocking surprise endings. Exactly. The and, only thing that's a mystery is is that did he kill his wife and daughter? Right. And but it's not much of a mystery. And it's it basically says it comes right out and says everything you've seen hasn't been real. It's all been his perception. And this movie doesn't do that at the end. It leaves that no, that's question. That's what I love. I think that's what leads it to a new level is that he Me too. never yes. gives it away. <laughs> I, I totally agree. And that's my problem with Shutter Island is that it gives it away. It, it removes the ambiguity and therefore you walk out of the movie and you, there's not much left to think about. You know, another movie that I really like, and I don't think it gives it away, um, and it's still, it's you could watch it the whole way through and take it in one meaning, or you could also think that some of this is in the guy's imagination, is Brick. Yes, that's a really good, yeah, and also a noir. 
It's absolutely that's a neo noir. It's a neo noir, but it still mm-hmm. has you know all noir has basically the same structure. Now, obviously, see, noir kind of graduated. Like, I think there's only been in the past 20 years, in my mind, one legitimate noir film. And that is The Man Who Wasn't There by the Coen Brothers, because it is black and white. It's yes. set in that period. And it's just, it's an, it feels like a noir movie to me. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. It does. Yeah, it is a noir film. Uh, How, it, however, the, they, they, are, they kind of kicked off the whole neon noir genre like with uh, blood simple yeah blood simple is it, 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 that's yeah. a neon man it is a neon yeah it is neon and they're yeah that's a whole whole other genre uh and it, i think some of those some of the differences in these genres are pure are, are somewhat visual i think yes well like like for instance another la movie and it's a neon noir is to live and die in la yes it embraces the neon artificial aspects of the style and look of la in 1994 exactly. yes um so i mean those are these films which again it's they're neo noirs but well and i would say i just like the fun of it like a blade runner and blade runner 2049 those are those are neon noirs those are neon noirs and um, what about uh mulholland drive and lost highway both neon. Yeah, both neon, but also, again, both L.A. Yeah, and that's why I think when people were saying, like, they're, they're making this comparison that Under the Silver Lake, I hear I hear Lebowski mentioned, I hear yeah. Inherent Vice mentioned, I hear Mulholland Drive mentioned, and I think the reasons is that people are picking up on those neon noir themes, but not yes. understanding the genre, so they recognize Under the Silver Lake and they say, oh, it's like this or that because it's just the way they can describe it. But I right. think when you dig deep enough, it really does. It fits in nicely um, with what's going on in Los Angeles in these noir, in these noir movies. Absolutely. Um, and I, and that's just why like, I have now got a sort of special place in my heart for this film because <laughs> they don't make a lot of noir films of any type anymore. Right. And this is a very unique film. Uh, that said, I don't know that I can really recommend it to people. You got to get better on your recommendation skills, man. <laughs> I'm reckon this is why I figured if anybody that's listening to the show and has been listening, they, they're digging the kind of movies that we recommend. And I'm no, thinking, that's true. I know, mean, I look, I, I think, uh, I wouldn't go to my mom and say, you gotta see this under the Silver Lake movie. <laughs> that's exactly like who I'm talking about. Me, I'm, I'm not recommending this to my parents. But I mean, I don't think in most cases, most of the episodes we do are really <laughs> ever focus on films. This is for the people who are looking to say, yeah, I, I, I can get those. And that's why I think these movies, it's OK, because you're seeing lots of, you know, there's tons of uh, Spider-Man Far From Homes out oh, there. Oh, yeah. This is a and, totally different kind of movie. And if you're looking for something different, something that's going to tweak your brain. I mean, that's really that's the main thing I look for in a movie is do I see the world a little differently when I walk out of it? Have I been shown a new perspective on something? Has the director's eye shown me something? Uh, That's what I'm looking for is something that that tweaks things a little bit. You know, uh, 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 one of the most profound ones of those for me was Mulholland Drive. Where I walked, well, yeah. I mean, we've talked about that. Yeah. You don't come out the same way exactly after you see a film like that. Yeah, and I feel like Silver Lake is a little bit like that, where you come out of it and uh, you start looking for meaning in things where there might not be meaning. Well, also, when you see a film like this or Mulholland Drive, you are left going. Film doesn't always have to be a certain way, does it? Exactly. Yeah. And, and, and so when we start talking like that, that's where I'm like the more and more, you know, we always say this test, right, where you walk out and the the movie starts to disappear from your brain. Yeah. Um, or a movie you sort of liked a day later. It's sort of like, now nah, maybe it wasn't that good. Or this magic thing happens where your first viewing is OK, but you see it a second time and maybe even a third time. And now it's suddenly it's it's growing on you to the point yeah. where I really like this. And I'm already at that point where the first time around, I didn't think it was that great. And now I'm kind of in love with this movie a little bit. OK, that's in, Yeah. So I've only seen it once, uh, but but I, and I definitely want to see it again. But the reason I want to see it again is, uh, yes, I'm interested in all the puzzles and everything, but that's not my main motivation for wanting to see it again. It's because. And we talked about this the first time through. I sort of had some expectations about how a movie works, and I didn't really let go of them easily enough. Yes. 
But looking back on the movie, what I really like is the L.A. stuff. I like sort of the shambling attitude of the whole thing. Now he's kind of just bumbling through stuff. I think there's some humor in it. I think there's a, there's a lot of like Hollywood jokes, um, some of which are very subtle. Uh, but there's something about the tone and the attitude and the humor of the movie that makes me want to watch it again almost more than the puzzles. Well, yeah, because I think that on a different level, um, the director who's from, I believe he's from Michigan. His first two yeah. movies were from Michigan. You know, they were set in there. Now he's, I think he's had a taste of the L.A. experience. And I think he's being very cynical and he's taking a lot of the artificiality that he's experienced. Yes. And and how how today's young youth who's trying to break in. See, I also think that Andrew Garfield's character, though it's never mentioned what he does, I actually think he's an out of work actor. Oh, interesting. I just assumed he was a screenwriter. See, <laughs> but you thought he was in the fringes. Right. Well, that's another interesting thing is that in a sense, he's kind of crafting this story. Yes. Um, so there's another take. And I'm just like, the more we go on it, and I'm hoping, I'm hoping when we post this episode out there, um, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to find some Reddit threads to post this on, I'm hoping we hear back from listeners uh, that hear our theories and then just kind of, you know, I'm still looking for some theory that I haven't even heard yet. <laughs> yes. I would love to hear some new theories. Yeah, so, you know, please, audience, bring it to us. I'm going to watch it again at least one more time. If I come up with some crazy theory, I'll bring it on the show. Yeah, because I think that we've, you know, there's several movies we keep bringing back and talking yeah. about. So I have no problem if we need to come back and talk about this <laughs> film. <laughs> um, but I mean, you know, but our time is short. We spent a lot of time and uh, a, just a couple of quick notes on this film that I just, I mentioned earlier yeah. in the program. I mentioned the cigarettes. And yes, it the wasn't. Yeah, it wasn't until after I watched the whole movie and I got where it was going that I realized that this was another part of, like, the idea of the X-Files was all about paranoia. Yes. And so this character, it's another thing in his pop culture that he looks at his cigarettes and he sees, you know, a complete conspiracy. Exactly. <laughs> um, he also looks a lot like Anthony Perkins, by the way. <laughs> he really in... <laughs> does look like Anthony Perkins. So I Perkins. think there's a little no, thing there, too. <laughs> that uh, never occurred to me, but you're absolutely right. He does. I stole that because in, 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 in just in the recent days, somebody somebody said that to me. They watched this movie and they said, you know, he does. He looks a lot like Anthony Perkins. And I said, oh, my God, you were correct. Well, and Psycho is another movie that has a psychiatrist come in at the end and explain everything. Yeah, and that's okay. That was like, what, 1960, and people right. they had, were so freaked out by everything else they saw <laughs> that he's smart. He had to calm people down and give an explanation because people couldn't fathom that somebody would dress up like uh, right. his mom and kill people. So, you know, I get it. <laughs> um, yeah. You know, I think as a nine-year-old when I first saw it, I appreciated the psychiatrist at the end. <laughs> by the time I saw the Vince Vaughn version, I don't think I needed that as much. I never saw the Vince Vaughn version. I did actually. I'm I'm kind of a weird sort of admirer of it. Is as a weird failed experiment. Oh, I, yeah. I I love the idea of it. I just never got around to seeing it. Yeah. I just love that somebody gave uh, Gus Van Sant money to make that. It just, I, I know because like, what, it was clearly just a film experiment. <laughs> yeah, it was just like a personal fun thing for him to do to get inside Hitchcock's head. Yeah. Um, and then another movie, you know, because people love to hear what other related things are. And it's really I didn't like this movie that much, but it just the, the tone of it and the idea that the the person is not very reliable is uh, Cronenberg's Spider. Oh, wow. I forgot about that film. Yeah. With yeah. Ray with Fiennes, Ray, and you know what Ray I'm talking Fiennes, about. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, I dug deep, you know, <laughs> to get some of these out there. <laughs> OK, well, if we're going that deep, I'm going to bring out The Machinist. I, I know this is, you know, how we always have that one film that we've never seen. I haven't seen that. It's one of my wife's favorites. Okay. Well, it also has some what is real kind of stuff going on in it. Uh, so it's this is sort of like the subgenre of this is the what is real uh, well, subgenre. Yeah, it, it, it is kind of. It's, it's the... It, the oh, Angel Heart. I keep forgetting Angel Heart is a, is a, Angel key. Heart, it's a detective absolutely. movie and it has this whole thing, except for it explains itself at the end. Yeah. And I guess that's the question. Does does it I still do, love that? And, and and again, it all goes back to detour. <laughs> exactly, detour is the thing. And again, if you've, you've if you've never if this is the first time you're listening to this show, and you're like, what's this detour? Well, if, go to the Criterion Channel and watch that movie. It's fantastic. And don't watch the one that's on Amazon because it's a terrible print. Do not watch the Amazon print. Go directly to Criterion and collect your two hundred dollars. <laughs> 
Um, all right. Well, you know what? This has been awesome. Yeah. And a gang, it may be a few weeks. Uh, this is where we're finally at a point where uh, the two of us have some summer obligations and we may not be able to get onto the mic for a few weeks. So uh, enjoy this. And uh, if you, uh, you know, have a hankering to hear our voices, go back and listen to some old episodes. Yeah. And definitely give us feedback. Uh, Facebook, Twitter, our website, whatever. Uh, Instagram. Whatever. Or feedback at jimandteal.com. Yes. Yeah, contact us. Let us know what you want to hear about. Yes. Uh, yeah, because uh, I, well, so I think that uh, when we come back, hopefully, hopefully, fingers crossed, we will get a chance to talk about the Tarantino's latest Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Hopefully. Yep. Another L.A. movie. Here we go. Yeah. Yes. Right. I don't know what we, what category we're going to put it into. <laughs> it, it might just be in the subgenre of Tarantino because he's kind of he's got his own thing going on. He's kind of got his own subgenre. Yeah. Yeah. And we'll see, you know, it, it, what's always interesting is the more movies you make, the more you're going to get dinged for the stuff that you tend to do all the time. Yes. Even if you do it really well. So we're going to see what happens in this movie. Yeah. I uh, I'm reserving judgment. I'm not, yeah, I'm not going to say anything until I see it. <laughs> I, as a matter of fact, I'm trying to not hear anything about it because I feel like it, it would be fun to walk in cold yeah. and not know. And that's what I've been able to do with the last few of his films. I've seen the trailer, but that's about, I'm not doing yeah, any more Yeah, and he gives you that. some tape. He doesn't really, t- I got a feeling there's a lot more going on than whatever the trailer is. I, I think the trailer is pretty terrible, actually. What? Yep. Stop. You don't like it. You don't even watch trailers. So, you know, the idea is, is he's going to put something together. He's not going to tell you all the things that are going to really happen. It, well, it just doesn't even look like it has a story. Of course not. Because if he tells you what the story is, then he's going to give away the secrets. I just want a little hook. There's no hook mm. in the trailer. Well, if you don't think uh, Caprio and Pitt are a hook, <laughs> I can't help you, sir. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, that's that seems like that's the hook, and well, that's not enough. It's, for me. It, it, but that's the best part, is right. See, Tarantino is just a show. It, he's the hook. He, right? No, you're you right. Know he's you're gonna the get, hook. It's because you're going to get all sorts of stuff. Yes. Yeah. And then, uh, you know, I'm going to go see it in 35 millimeter. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, on film and uh, I'm going to see it the opening night, the Thursday of next week. I got tickets, got a few friends going and I'm hoping it'll be a packed audience and it'll be a lot of fun. Excellent. And then, you know, look, I'm honest. I, if I don't like it, I'm going to come and tell you I don't like it. Oh, I will definitely not hold back. Yeah. I mean, you know, we still <laughs> we, we still had this thing where we like uh, together saw Jackie Brown. Um, yes. When it first came out and we all walked out of the theater, it was a bunch of us and we, we really did not like that film. Yeah. And uh, I don't think you ever watched it again, right? Nope. Never seen it since. That's a movie I have to, I reevaluated because I have seen it many, many times because it's a film that if it's on and I turn right. it on, I have to watch it from wherever it starts. It's just the, the one of those films. So I've ended up seeing it maybe 10 times. And oh, wow. I really I really like it because I had expectations of what I thought he was going to do and what he should do. Right. And it's a very different kind of thing than you were expecting. Yeah. But see, it took him a few other movies to see his style develop and see where the Jackie Browns, you know, that like you thought of him as one type of director. And right. then that just felt too different. So it's a film that's re- really worth revisiting, especially if you haven't seen it in 20 years. Okay. I, I definitely will at some point. All right. We you're should like, wrap yeah, it you're up. Yeah, you're going to get right on that. Roma and then uh, <laughs> and the Jackie Brown. All right, kids. Uh, have a great one, everybody. And uh, we'll catch you in August, hopefully. Thanks for listening. All right. Bye.